Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast which focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host as ever, Stuart Blues, and this is the first episode of a brand new season. Thank you so much for bearing with me during my recent off-season. I appreciate that not everyone will be a fan of my collabs or my movie episodes, but it really breaks up the monotony for me. It gives me a few weeks off from writing as well, which is always appreciated. If you're already a fan of the show, then welcome back. If not, then it's worth me reiterating that each of my seasons contains 10 episodes and we're now at the start of season four. If I sound a little bit weird, it's because I've had a cold for what feels like years now. It's realistically about 10 days. It's not COVID, so don't worry, I've done tests. It's just a little bit of bunged upness, if you like. So I'm okay, don't worry about it. I've got lots of shout outs to do, seeing as it's been a while since I've done a proper episode, but I'll save them for the end rather than going through them all now because there is quite a few. Those of you who listened to my third season will know that I introduced an opening icebreaker segment called Dad Facts. I basically read out a fact from a set of cards my daughter got me and see if I know it, and usually I don't. I do have a jingle for it now though, recorded by none other than my little girl. Here it is. Welcome to Daddy Facts. How cute is that? <laughs> Absolute nightmare to try and get her to say that. She does speak well, but when you do it on command, mm, not so much. So let's do it then. This week's Dad Fact is... I'm just getting the card out of the packet. Let's have a look. <clears throat> In 1998, all 11 members of a Congolese football team were killed by a bolt of lightning. Hmm. I don't know, again, with these facts, I don't know how, I always say I don't know how useful they would be in the jungle if you were stranded on a desert island, knowing that about a Congolese football team. It might pass 10 seconds of conversation, but I don't think it would save your life. So another one of those great facts next week. I do have one more opening segment, and this one is new. I was recently sent a book by the infamous Rose Bundy. Rose Bundy notoriously reviews podcasts. I was the first one to be reviewed and it was absolutely brutal. But, you know, we get on. I saw the funny side. Now, Rose sent me the first book that she's done. This is called The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. And yes, I'm professional now. I have a jingle for that too. Here it is. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. <laughs> I love that one. For those not in the know, a haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of 5, 7 and 5. It's meant to be read in one breath. So, here we go. I've not read any of these yet. Let's read the first one. Prowling through the yard, senses tingling and alert, blood black on white tile. Spooky. Another one of those next week. And thank you as ever for sending that in, Rose Bundy. Absolute legend. But without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. This case was suggested by listener Lizzie Hayes. Lizzie sent an email to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com asking me to cover this case. And I just added it to my episode list. It's that simple. The entire season, this season four, is going to be made up of listener suggestions, by the way. So if you do want me to cover a case and get a shout out, that's the way to get in touch. Please send me an email or reach out on social media. As always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. We're back in England's capital city of London this week. More specifically, we're focusing on the West London suburb of Acton. Being a northerner, I'll happily admit I'd never even heard the name Acton before researching this episode, but I found out quite a few fun things about it. Did you know that Acton, which apparently translates as Oak Town in Anglo-Saxon, is where a legendary English rock band hails from? Can you guess who? There's a clue in what I just said. Out of guesses? Okay. Who I'm talking about is The Who. See what I did there? Founding members Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend and John Entwistle all grew up in Acton and attended Acton County Grammar School. 
If you're from Acton, the school I'm referring to is now known as Arc Acton Academy because it's got some sponsorship now and it's got academy status. Though it has also been called Acton County Comprehensive, Reynolds High School and Acton High School. That's a lot of name changes for one school, isn't it? Any Monty Python fans might be interested to know that Churchfield Road in Acton was the location used to film the sketch Bicycle Repairman. It's in the third episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus, and the episode's called How to Recognise Different Types of Trees from Quite a Long Way Away. It aired all the way back in 1969. Basically, everyone goes about their business dressed as Superman, but Michael Palin has a secret identity, which is that of Bicycle Repairman. Think of it as a reverse Superman spoof. It, I didn't find it that funny, I'll be honest. I like Monty Python Life of Brian, but the old sketches, yeah, hit and miss for me. My final Acton fact is that Acton Power Station was used as a filming location for Tim Burton's Batman in 1989, the year I was born, and James Cameron's 1986 film Aliens. Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare might like that Aliens fact. It's one of her favourite movies. Right, I promise I'm done talking nonsense, and now I'm truly going to get into this week's episode. Any new listeners? I always do a load of waffle at the start. Let me take you back 18 months to March 2020. On March 16th, 2020, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, Now is the time for everyone to stop non-essential contact and travel. In response to the coronavirus outbreak. First Boris impression I've ever attempted. On March 23rd, 2020, Johnson announced the first lockdown in the UK and ordered people to stay at home. Uh, stay safe, but go to work. If you can't, work from home, go to work. But if you can, work from home, etc. On March 25th, two days later, the Coronavirus Act 2020 received legal assent. And finally, on March 26, 2020, lockdown measures legally came into force in the UK. But why am I telling you the timeline of the first UK lockdown? The reason is that it's extremely relevant to this week's story as the mental impacts of being locked down play a part in why the events I'm about to go through took place. Before I get into any detail, I do just want to make you aware that this week's episode contains graphic detail about the death of a child and discussions around mental illness which some listeners may find distressing. Olga Freeman and her son Dylan Freeman are who we're focusing on this week. The mother and son were born in 1980 and 2010 respectively from what I could make out. Olga, who is originally from Russia, was previously married to renowned celebrity lifestyle and fashion photographer Dean Freeman and the pair brought Dylan into the world in, again, I think it was 2010. Dean Freeman has photographed the likes of David Beckham, the Spice Girls and Bradley Cooper throughout his career and interestingly, Dean's dad was Robert Freeman, a photographer and graphics designer who actually shot some of the Beatles album covers. If you're interested, Robert Freeman shot the covers for With the Beatles, Beatles for Sale, Help and Rubber Soul, some of their earlier albums I believe. My dad might like that fact. Let's come back to the story now and focus on Dylan in particular. Dylan was a bright boy who was really into his art and often visited galleries with his father Dean. With a father and grandfather making it big in the field of photography, it kind of makes sense that Dylan shared that same passion. It's worth pointing out here that Dylan was severely autistic and required the use of a wheelchair in order to get around. He was also unable to speak as a result of his disabilities. Officially, Dylan had been diagnosed with autism, global neurodevelopmental delay, progressive myopia and significant difficulties with language and communication, self-help and independence. He required around-the-clock care and attended a special school five days a week. During that first UK lockdown, Dean was living in Spain and Olga was given the responsibility of taking care of Dylan on her own. In 2019, the year before the first lockdown and the outbreak of the coronavirus, Olga had help looking after Dylan from a carer named Rakesh Shukla. Mr Shukla, who was in his mid-twenties at the time, explained that he actually had to give the job up because he found it too demanding. 
In an interview with the Mail Online, Mr Shukla said, Dylan had a lot of disabilities, couldn't speak, and was prone to sudden outbursts when he'd start kicking his arms and legs and throwing things around. My work involved taking him out to the park for a couple of hours so that Olga could have some time to herself. I only did it about three or four times, but it was too much for me, so I had to tell her that I couldn't continue. I found it very stressful, so I can't imagine what it must have been like for her. From my research, it appears that after Mr. Shukla stopped helping care for Dylan, Olga had no further assistance and was basically left entirely on her own. That situation was only made more difficult once the UK's first lockdown measures came into place. Now from memory, everyone had to stay at home unless you were classed as an essential worker, but even then, we were advised to work from home where possible. The majority of people were placed onto a national furlough scheme and were only allowed to exercise, I think, for an hour a day or to leave the house once a day for essential items. It was something like that. I mean, there's been that many lockdowns and rule changes here that I'm probably remembering it wrong, so feel free to correct me on that. My point is that Olga barely had any time to herself, not even a couple of hours here and there, because Mr. Shukla was now gone. That being said, it does appear that Dylan did have another carer. It was one of Olga's friends called Edita Supikaja, though she was only able to offer assistance for around 12 hours each week. Now, 12 hours out of 168 hours each week is barely a drop in the ocean when Dylan needs around-the-clock care. It's just over 7% of the entire week. And Dylan was also unable to attend the special school at first due to all the schools being closed as a result of the lockdown measures. Olga, who had a history of suffering from depression and anxiety, was severely affected by all of the aforementioned factors. She was noted as being a very caring and attentive mother, but it seems like the overwhelming number of factors imposed on her sadly took their toll. As always, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying here as a form of sympathising. I just deem it to be very important to provide you with the full background of what went on in each of the cases I cover. There's never any bias here on British murders, it's more like a full fact find that provides you, the audience, with the whole story from all angles. Olga was an intelligent woman, she'd been through university, she'd acquired a law degree, but psychiatrist Dr Martin Locke explained how the COVID-19 lockdown caused her to develop psychotic symptoms due to the high level of stress she was under. On several occasions, Olga wrote to Ealing Council requesting increased financial assistance, but they were noted as being extremely slow in responding to her. I suppose given the lockdown situation, you can kind of understand that the council, they probably were inundated with requests for help, but that's not really a valid excuse considering what happened. In July 2020, Olga visited her local doctor to ask if she was entitled to any further support to help care for Dylan. On the back of Olga's request, the doctor wrote a letter to social services asking for more help due to a vulnerable child's mother struggling to care for him. Olga was described in the letter as being exhausted and she'd even told a doctor that she was worried about falling asleep in the bath due to burnout. Another doctor wrote a similar letter to social services the following week, but sadly no response was received before tragedy struck. By August 2020, Olga was at her wit's end, and sadly she suffered a complete mental breakdown. On August 9th, 2020, Edith Sopikaja recalled how Olga made a very bizarre and worrying comment about claiming to be the second Jesus. Olga had also told a neighbour she had been chosen by God to save the world, and referenced the 2019 film called Anna, which is about a Russian assassin who wants to escape her trapped life. Edith noted that Olga's mental health had rapidly declined over the lockdown months. Six days later, on August 15th, 2020, Edith spent the first part of the day with Olga and was helping to look after Dylan. Once she'd gone home, Edith went about her usual business before receiving a phone call from Olga later that same day. Olga was saying more worrying things. She was saying things like, insisting that she needed to go to Jerusalem, so sort of sticking to this I am the second Jesus story. 
The final thing she said to Edith before the call ended was that she had killed Dylan and excused her actions by claiming she was doing what was best for him. Olga then said, This is my job, to sacrifice my beloved child to create a balance in this world. I don't know about you, but for me, this woman has now gotten to the point where she is beyond stable and is clearly acting in a way that indicates she is not in full control of her faculties. Again, I'm not excusing the murder of a child here, but it's clear to see that this woman went past her breaking point and unfortunately took it out on her innocent son. The police were soon called and after arriving at Olga's home, they found Dylan's body underneath a duvet in the master bedroom. Olga had strangled her son to death using her bare hands as well as a bra and made sure that he wouldn't be able to breathe by forcing a sponge down his throat to completely block his airways. She then placed his body where he liked to sleep and surrounded him with his toys to, in Olga's words, allow him to die with dignity and kindness. How truly heartbreaking is that? 73-year-old Keith Grindrod, a neighbour who lives in a flat next to the building, claimed he was woken by a scream in the middle of the night. He said, It sounded like a little scream next door. It was a childish scream. It was just enough to wake me up. Olga appeared at the Old Bailey on August 19, 2020 and was initially charged with murder. She was remanded in custody by Judge Mark Lucraft QC until November 4th, 2020, though it was subsequently pushed back. On January 25th, 2021, Olga Freeman appeared at court via video link from a psychiatric hospital and pleaded not guilty to the murder of her son, Dylan Freeman. I know what you're thinking. How can she plead not guilty when she knows she's killed him? But what she actually did was she pleaded guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility. That plea came after several assessments of her mental health by three hospital psychiatrists. Each of the psychiatrists noted how Olga had diminished responsibility at the time of Dylan's death given the fact she was suffering from a depressive illness with psychotic symptoms. Kristen Katsouris of the Crown Prosecution Service said the following about the tragedy. This was a tragic death of a child at the hands of his mother who was struggling to cope. Olga Freeman had loved and cared for Dylan for many years, but the strain and pressures of her son's severe and complex special needs had built up, and that, combined with her impaired mental health, led to heartbreaking consequences. Mrs Justice Chima Grubb delayed Olga's sentencing until February 2021 and said that she was considering detaining Olga in a psychiatric hospital as opposed to sending her to prison. On February 11, 2021, Olga Freeman was handed a hospital order without a limit of time, which means she will be detained in a psychiatric hospital indefinitely under Section 37 of the Mental Health Act 1983. Olga can only be discharged from the hospital if her clinician thinks she is well enough to leave. Even then, the clinician is required to ask the Secretary of State for Justice to agree to her release. So even if her clinician thinks that actually she's rehabilitated, she's well enough, she's got her faculties back, she can leave, still have to go to the Secretary of State for Justice to actually get that release approved. Until that time, Olga cannot leave the hospital under any circumstances. If she does try to leave, they'll simply bring her back, track her down, bring her back. Mrs Justice Chima Grubb said in her closing statement, I have no doubt at all that you were a remarkably loving and dedicated mother to a vulnerable child until multiple pressures overwhelmed you and your mind was swamped by a destructive illness with florid psychotic elements. To some unknowable extent, it should be recognised that Dylan was an indirect victim of interruption to normal life caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Dylan's father Dean released a statement paying tribute to his son. It said, Dylan was a beautiful, bright, inquisitive and artistic child who loved to travel, visit art galleries and swim. We travelled extensively over the years together, spending such memorable time in places including Brazil, France and Spain. Dylan was the delight of my life and always will be. I miss my son and I would have had many more holidays with him. I would have taken him to many more art galleries and gone swimming in the sea. 
Dean's agent went on record saying, I can't begin to comprehend his loss. He was a loving and caring father, and even though divorced for a number of years, he cherished all the quality time spent with his son. A child safeguarding practice review is ongoing and will consider the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. A statement issued on behalf of Ealing Safeguarding Children Partnership said it was clear from evidence from the review so far that Dylan's death could not have been foreseen. It added, Dylan was receiving 30 hours of care a week, 16 of which were funded through direct payments from the council. Although Mrs Freeman requested that the council meet the full financial cost, she had assured that this care package was in place. The council was in the process of approving the cost of the additional hours. Regular contact was maintained between professionals of all agencies and Dylan and his mother. A high level of support remained in place, including the option of Dylan returning to school as the school remained open. But the challenges arising from the pandemic and Mrs Freeman's concern for Dylan's health meant that she felt unable to take up the breadth of services that were offered to the family. So there you have it. That was the tragic story of Olga and Dylan Freeman. What did you think of that case? Do you think that Olga's diminished responsibility plea and subsequent sentencing was correct? Or do you think that she should, in fact, have been charged with murder and sent to prison? It's a difficult one and when I've said in there that, you know, I'm not trying to sympathise for a murderer or sort of negate the impacts of what's happened, you can kind of see where everything's gone wrong for Olga and I think that's reflective in the sentencing and the closing comments from the judge there because they're saying, look, you've had all these impacts on you, we believe that you weren't in the right frame of mind, you did have diminished responsibility at the time, all these burdens were coming on you, you know, Dylan was extremely hard work and, you know, your old carer left and you had your friend looking after him, but looking at the review, were there options she could have taken on board? It's really difficult one, but at the end of the day, the main thing is there's a 10 year old boy there who's been killed by his mother. And that's what we have to focus on, remembering Dylan, his life and what could have been. It's a sad case, however you want to look at it. Please get in touch and let me know what you thought of it. I would love to hear your perspective on this very tragic case. Now, as I said at the start, it's time for some shout outs and some updates now. You may remember that I said a few weeks ago that I was going to start doing 10 minute movie reviews of bad horror films. So I kind of still am and I have two episodes recorded so far, but I've decided to release them just on YouTube and not on the main podcast feed. The reasoning is a combo of things, basically a lack of time, and I don't want to diversify my podcast content too much, and, you know, I don't want to put you guys off, basically. I want to stick to true crime as much as I can with, with just the odd movie episode, maybe in my off-seasons or mid-season. It'll also give my YouTube the chance to gain a few more views on the way to, hopefully one day, being monetized. <laughs> Quite a way off yet. Thanks again to Lizzie Hayes for suggesting this case. I'd like to thank Arwen for buying me two beers on buymeacoffee.com slash British Murders. Here's some reviewer shout outs. Mifanwi1987 left me a five star review on iTunes and said, stumbled across you on Spotify, went to iTunes and I've been listening all night. Brillo. Thanks for that. Wombling Free also left a five star review on iTunes and said, fascinating insight into lesser known murders around the British Isles. As I'm from London, the places and people are more relatable than, say, a similar American podcast. Please note, I only relate to the places and non-murderers in the stories. <laughs> Thanks for that. Zach Darby is a Twitter legend. He always promotes the show. He left five-star reviews on both iTunes and Podchaser. He said, Another favourite true crime podcast. Each episode is packed with information about the crime, everything leading up to it, and aftermath. Stuart has a very soothing voice and puts a lot of detail into this series, A+. Thanks so much for that, Zach. You are an absolute legend. And finally, Gemma0610. Don't know if that means June 10 or 10 June. I don't know. Left me a review saying, Love the podcast. Came over from TikTok after seeing a few videos. Great to learn about lesser known murders. Also enjoyed the special episodes with guests. Gemma said that, but then she left me a two-star review. So I'm not sure if that was an error, but... You know, I appreciate your kind words all the same. I did also receive a one-star review from someone, which made me chuckle. 
One star reviews are a badge of honour in this game. In reference to my Chris Benoit bonus episode, <laughs> it said, <laughs> Worst episode in the history of podcasts. Normally, this podcast is okay, but the Chris Benoit podcast is disrespectful and geared towards six-year-old thugs. Worst. <laughs> oh, brilliant. For more on British Murders, please check out all my social media channels and YouTube. Merchandise is available to purchase at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. Again, send me an email to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Send a case suggestion or message me on social media. And finally, reviews, as I said, they can be left on iTunes or Podchaser or both. But for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.